Thank you all for coming. Those of you that are sitting down there, feel free to move down this way. There's a load of space ish down there, so um, yeah, feel free. Don't cramp yourselves up against the wall. So thank you all so very much for coming to this um, this Richardson Institute roundtable event on Syria. I'm really pleased to uh, to see so many faces here and to be able to welcome friends and colleagues onto this panel. So I'll just quickly introduce people on the panel, then we can crack on and get to the the really interesting stuff. I think it's a really important time that we do this in light of uh, the US, UK and French decision to, to engage in airstrikes in Syria against the, the targets of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. And that took place while I was in the US and it was obviously quite a, a worrying time for, for many people raising questions about uh, the legality of strikes, the, the ethical nature of the strikes, the practical nature the strategic nature, so lots of questions start to, to be raised when, when this military action took place. But it's important to put this in the context of, of a seven year long struggle, war, revolution, uprising that has become incredibly politicized and securitized, resulting in over half a million deaths, 11 million displacements from a population of around 22 million people. So an incredibly tragic series of events that is seemingly intractable, but what we want to do today is try and shed a little bit of light on it, particularly with regard to what happened a week ago, ten days ago. I'm sort of losing track of time uh, in recent days. But anyway, uh, enough of, of that rambling. Let's get started. On my right we have Dr. Raha Faluki, who is a visiting fellow at the LSE Middle East Centre yes. and lecturer at Manchester in the modern history of the Middle East. Is that right? <laughs> But more importantly and more excitingly, um, Rahaf will be joining us here at Lancaster as a lecturer in Middle East Studies starting in September, which is wonderful. Really excited to have her joining us. Um, I'm Simon Mayborn, as many of you may be aware. On my left is Dr. Mark Garnett, Senior Lecturer in British Politics. And uh, Mark will be talking a little bit about the, the British involvement in the the lead up to the, uh, the military action and what happened in terms of parliament and parliamentary decisions and the, the British political climate. And then on my far left is Professor James A. Sweeney. Damn it, it's not rectified. I'm so sorry. It's all right. um, James is an international <coughs> lawyer, international human rights lawyer, a bit of both. Yeah. And, and James is going to look at the, the legal dimensions of the decision to engage in strikes against, uh, against the regime of Bashar al-Assad. So I think if we put all of these things together, we'll hopefully shed a bit of light on what is an incredibly complex picture and an incredibly complex set of uh, set of issues. So without further ado, I'll pass over to Rahaf. Oh, thank, so, thank you very much for giving me the chance to give a talk today. So my talk aims to cover three areas, different parts: the history of Syria, what what things, what what how the life. Uh, how we live our life there in Syria, the politics, the politics, the political life, the ideology that behind the Ba'ath regime, and then what happened in 2011, and then we, I will move to the most common misconceptions about the Syrian war or the uprising. So when we say Syria, it's often first thing that comes to mind: war, civil war, sectarianism, chemical weapons, and uh, violence and, and militarism. But what's what's really missing and essential to understand that behind this militaristic upheavals that, that broke in 2011, that how people lived their lives before Syria and whether the militaristic situation that is now in Syria, whether it has its traces and its origins in Syria before 2011. And here brings us to the questions of what is the Ba'ath ideology or how Assad ruled Syria before 2011. And here it's important to understand that these, these militarism or the, the eruption of militaristic uh, uh, conflict in Syria does not start, did not start in 2011, but rather has its roots in the Ba'ath ideology itself. So what is the Ba'ath ideology just in, in, in a very basic uh, or very uh, in brief? It's about being able to fight and to sacrifice yourself. But these two notions are very much interrelated with sacrificing yourself for a personalized leadership, for one leader. Um, it's very essentially about being a man and able uh, to be violent, to save uh, not only the homeland or the nation, but also uh, uh, to be able to, to to be not only able, but just to sacrifice the soul and, and, and your blood for Assad's family. So um, before before the Ba'ath 
when the bath ideology was like kind of emerged in 1950s and then uh, Syria after the independence from the uh, from the French uh, mandate in 1946. Uh, here comes uh, the many uh, 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 bloodless uh, cause, military cause, until Hafs al-Assad came to power in 1970s. And from that uh, part, Assad ruled Syria in a one, in a semi-Leninist uh, one single, um, in single, single party system, where everything becomes militarized. Since you are seven years old, as a child, you go to school and you become a party just voluntarily. So you wear the khaki uniform, in, at, at 12 years old you, you kind of learn how to use the clashing code. And here it's important how the Ba'ath ideology uh, kind of put its basis on hating the other. And here the other kind of manifested in Israel, Western power, imperialism, and, and of course these were all very imaginary wars. We didn't launch these wars, but it was always created to securize and legitimize the Assad's rule. Um, uh, it's, it's important here to mention that the Ba'ath regime also was very xenophobic. And here when I mention this, it's about hating the other. And this other, sometimes not only about hating what's behind the Syrian borders, like Western, uh, or the West or the Israel, but it's also hating others within the Syrian uh, communities, like Kurds, Palestinians. So Palestinians and Kurds don't have any national, they, they are not allowed to have a Syrian nationality, for example. Um, other thing that I want to say that we, we lived Syrians lived a life that is very politically they were very politically <coughs> repressed. Everything was controlled. Everything was like a, a kind. Um, it, it, it was run in a system like um, uh, that. You have uh, um, intelligence intelligence spies all over you. So you have a friend. If if this friend kind of open any any political discussion, you kind of sense oh he is a spy. He's trying to report me. So you would uh, so there is no way that you are allowed to speak anything about politics. So anyway. Assad uh, died in in, um, in 2000, and here that he, he kind in a hasty moment, um, um, in a hasty moment, in a very quick moment, the parliament changed the, the Syrian constitution and allowed Bashar al-Assad to come because he was 30, 34 years old, and um, uh, and the, the Syrian constitution states that the president is only allowed to come uh, to be to be in power when he is 40. So in a very hasty uh, kind of way on TV is that, okay, um, Bashar al-Assad um, um, becomes um, our president. When Bashar al-Assad came, he had a civil profile. He was not trying to present himself as a militaristic man. So he was trying to say, okay, I'm going to bring some economic reforms. Of course, um, he kind of mentioned that there would be some political reforms, but nothing of that happened. And here, Syrians tried, or civil society, or kind of some activists tried to have a Damascene uh, Spring, which is a, it was a group of civil um, activists uh, trying just for some uh, for of the list of emergency act, which kind of um, states that anyone can be uh, detained um, without any um, without any reason. Of course, they, all these acts become they were uh, detained, um, and then in a in a kind and here comes to the um, to the where to, to, to 2011 when in a kind of a revolutionary context, Syrians had the hope that now with Egypt and Libya and Tunisia that now we have the hope that we will walk into the streets. Um, I think all of you know kind of uh, the story about the, the Syrian revolution or the Syrian uprising, but what is really kind of, uh, there is behind this a contested narrative about the Syrian revolution. So some of the miscon most m common misconceptions about Syria or the Syrian wars is that Assad is fighting terrorism. And here it's important that um, Assad kind of uh, released uh, many uh, non-terrorists from prisons in 2013 because he knows that if these people, if these jihadists, uh, uh, if these jihadists were released, they are gonna turn the peaceful demonstration or the peaceful uprising into a militaristic one. Another misconception that Assad is the only viable alternative. Other than, other than this, ISIS is an oppositional, uh, is an opposition group. 
ISIS has a different mentality or a different kind of ideology from the Syrian opposition. They don't, they don't care about Syria, they, they, they want to go be, beyond the, the, the state's borders. So, um, I've just mentioned these three misconceptions about Syria and uh, a bit of the history about um, how life was there and how did we go. So, I would uh, kind of uh, give the mic to Simon. Great. Thanks, Raha. I'm going to talk very, very briefly just how events in Syria post-2011 have become incredibly internationalized. And I think there are two things to, to take out of this brief set of remarks. One is that the conflict has taken on a regional importance, and the second is that it's taken on a sort of an international importance. And the regional dynamics stem from the, the geopolitical concerns of, of the, the sort of regional powers, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Qatar, Turkey, uh, to a lesser extent Israel, I guess. But the reason that this is the case is in part because of the, the nature of the regional security environment, the sort of echo chamber, if you will, of, of norms, of values, of identities, of ideologies, of religion, and the, the porous nature of, of borders across the Middle East. So all of these ideas, identities, and, and narratives spread. And when you start to see sectarian narratives spreading across the region, being done instrumentally for, for political purposes, not for purely theological differences, then you, you start to see how other states get involved. And so you see the Iranians getting involved to support their ally, Bashar al-Assad, who's, uh, who's an Alawite, but ostensibly by, uh, by fatwa, a Shia. And conversely, you see the Sunni states, such as Saudi Arabia and Qatar, uh, getting involved in supporting opposition groups, providing financial support, providing weapons, training. So it quickly takes on a regional importance, in the sense that... Uh, the external states, states beyond Syria, saw it an opportunity to increase their geopolitical standing, increase their influence across the region by, uh, by reducing the influence of, of their, their, um, their rival and reducing the influence of their rival's allies. So, very quickly, what happened in Syria, the, the, the protests, the pro-democracy protests, starts to become imbued with, with additional meanings, with additional um, security concerns that threaten to but never truly overtake the concerns of the people on the ground in Syria. But increasingly it's framed as such. Syria is increasingly framed as a proxy conflict or a direct conflict between all these external actors. And of course that's true, of course there is that type of dimension, but I think it's important to remember that there is this struggle on the ground, that it is a Syrian war between opposition groups and, and the, the regime, the brutal regime of Bashar al-Assad. But there is that regional dimension. There's also an international dimension, as, um, as Russia and America have got involved for geopolitical and normative reasons. The sense that uh, Russia has got a long-standing relationship with the re regime of, of Assad, going back to Hafez, uh, in part because of the, uh, the naval base of Tartus, but also um, because of an air base as well, I believe. And, and that, of course, was really important in propping up the regime of, of Assad because I think it was in 2014 that it looked like there was a crisis point where the Assad regime was going to fall but Russian air support got involved and actually <coughs> helped Assad to, to defeat the opposition groups and it really swung the tide uh, back in the favour of Assad and then US groups have got involved initially to, uh, to fight against Daesh but recently there's, there's taken on that additional complexity with regard to Assad, with regard to conventions and norms about the use of chemical weapons, which James is going to talk more about. But other international actors have got involved as well, including efforts to, to remove chemical weapons from Syria. I've spoken to people who were involved in doing that, and they said they only got maybe 80% of all the chemical weapons out of Syria back in 2013, 2012. And so that suggests that there is still this legacy, there is still uh, a range of, of yeah, a, a number of, of stashes of chemical weapons that have routinely been used by, uh, by the Assad regime on his own population. And that, that can be traced back across this conflict at devastating cost. Now, of course, this has been framed in a number of different ways. There have been allegations of false flag operations, allegations that opposition groups have been...
making it look like the Assad regime has been using uh, chemical weapons, but it's pretty evident that it is the Assad regime. We know that Assad still has chemical weapons, we know that he's used them in the past, and got away with it. So that suggests that there's, there's something else at play, perhaps, in, in this legal decision that James is going to talk more about. The final point I want to make is that there's an additional thing that we've got to remember. Yes, chemical weapons are incredibly brutal. Yes, they've been used routinely by Assad. And yeah, it's an incredibly abhorrent thing to do in war. It's prohibitive. But Assad has also used conventional weapons. Syrian and Russian military forces have used conventional weapons to kill hundreds of thousands of people. So I think there's, there's a tricky question that must be raised here about the, the sort of the continued brutal bombardment of civilians and opposition groups by the Assad military and the Russian forces. But it seems to be that only when chemical weapons are used does, does the West particularly care. So with that, I'll hand over to Mark who's going to talk a bit about the British context. Uh, yes, thank you Simon. It seems horribly parochial to be talking about Britain in this context. Uh, and, and I guess my remarks as much as anything will be a, a, a prelude to, uh, to James's uh, contribution on the international law side of things. However, it is an opportunity to, uh, I guess it's one of these occasions where a, an assessment of Britain's role in the world is uh, fairly appropriate. And um, from my own take on Britain's uh, kind of perception of itself in the current climate um, is a, a kind of a constructed identity which is which consists of two different elements and the first element is just a hangover from the time when Britain was probably the greatest power on earth and that is a continued belief that Britain is a, is a world power is a global power and can make a difference in the world and then the second element is, is partly a product I think of the way in which Britain left the uh, empire and it's a rational, it's a rationalism of that uh, particular process. It ignores an awful lot of very inconvenient details, but it's one which presents Britain as a, a power which is inevitably on the side of good. Which it, Britain is a force for a, a, a strong moral force in the world, and I think that these. This kind of twin identity, this dual identity, which is entirely constructed and very convenient. It's being peddled by politicians, it's being promulgated by the media. It is, however, I would say, accepted by the majority of British people. Uh, I would say, although I don't want to reopen any wounds, I would say that certainly the great global power narrative was accepted by a lot of the... Uh, we hear constantly that Britain voted for Brexit. Well, if Britain voted for Brexit, a large reason for that, a large part of that, was this continuing belief that Britain isn't just a European power, it's got global reach. And I think that uh, in the 1990s, at the end of the Cold War, <coughs> this is when this particular identity became particularly important in uh, influencing British foreign policy. The Cold War uh, was a period in which clearly uh, Britain's independence was very much in doubt. In 1999, uh, Tony Blair, I think, gave the best expression of these twin views of Britain and the world in his Chicago speech, where he, broadly speaking, said that Britain should intervene in cases uh, moral, particularly where uh, moral principles are at stake, but it should only do so when this is going to be effective. And that, in a way, was, I think, uh, as much as anything, was a way of repeating the familiar refrain that Britain is a force in the world for its own sake, but it's even more of a force of a, in the world because it's so closely tied to its American ally. And then uh, Blair was obviously talk, talking in the, in the wake of successful interventions, Kosovo, etc., where either America had been helpful or Sierra Leone, where Britain did make quite an independent um, impact. And there it seemed Britain had stumbled across a way of expressing its constructed identity uh, in world politics, which in a way, uh, wasn't likely to expose the underlying problems with that formulation because the assumption was that Britain would always be supported by America and so the question of the effectiveness of British action in the post-Cold War environment wouldn't really be difficult. 
basically Britain would be effective if it and America decided that they were going to go on the same uh, on the same kind of crusade. All of that uh, uh, narrative was disrupted by the war on terror and, of course, uh, Iraq. Now, I would say that the thing about Iraq is very obviously a very interesting, very complex debate on the British side. However, in the aftermath of Iraq, the world power element of the formulation became more and more problematic. It was pretty clear that, uh, if, you know, that the two things didn't go together, that Britain had shown that in re, uh, its uh, alliance with America it could kind of make a difference, but the result was clearly one which didn't satisfy anyone's kind of moral principles. So, whereas Blair laid down a fairly clear view of Britain's role in the world, incoherent in some res underlying respects as it might seem, at least it was a fairly simple uh, formula, all of that was, uh, I think, undermined by the legacy of Iraq. Then on Syria and the Arab Spring, obviously we have intervention in Libya, etc. Then we come to two parliamentary votes on Syria, which I think again show the way in which the Blair-Chicago principles have been uh, exposed to cruel reality since uh, 2003 and the intervention in Iraq. So we have a vote uh, to authorize military action against Assad and that immediately comes up against this idea, this problem of the world power. First of all, can Britain on its own make any difference in that battle against Assad? Well the answer is no. But the second one is, can Britain even in alliance with America? make any great difference to the Assad regime, given that this is a, such a sensitive area with so many other world powers involved. And on that occasion, Parliament voted no. Then, when you get a second su subsequent vote uh, to authorise bombing against Daesh, then we have a different answer. And again, in this case, uh, the answer is prompted by feeling that whereas the intervention against Assad would be prompted by moral considerations and therefore it allowed parliamentarians the kind of the leisure to decide whether they were going to indulge in moral gestures or not, the other one seemed to have far more to do with Britain's national security, in which case the, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, alliance with America, etc., uh, is brought to bear and it looks then as if uh, Britain will be able to make a difference because it's got a target which doesn't have anything like the kind of international support that the Assad regime. So you have two contradictory votes which I think can be explained without necessarily just looking at the legacy of Iraq. I think in the first vote uh, British parliamentarians did partly vote against bombing Syria because they wanted to make up for the mistake they made on Iraq. But I think underlying it is this kind of the way in which Britain's perceived identity in the world has been challenged by events in which it has taken place. And in 2018, we then have again the question, the first question is reawakened, the question of military intervention against uh, Assad. And Theresa May manages to solve the problem by not consulting Parliament at all. So you have one vote in which Parliament says no, one vote in which Parliament says yes, and then another vote in which Parliament is excluded from taking any kind of a vote. And I think you can see partly why that is the case, because there was no way of predicting which way Parliament would swing given that it activated these two underlying principles or ideas of Britain, the moral one clearly points to doing something, and something rather more energetic perhaps than just talking, humanitarian considerations, etc. The ones that were activated in the 90s over Bosnia apply, I would say, and James will say, uh, I know far more about this than myself, but I would have thought the humanitarian case is certainly no less strong than the one that was used against the Milosevic regime, uh, but the other uh, question, of course, that was exercising parliamentarians was one, whether we could do more harm than good by intervening, and in particular whether this would bring us face to face with our uh, you know, favourite bugbear at the moment, and then particularly in the wake of the Salisbury incident, uh, with Russia. So, looking at this kind of event at any rate, and, and I'm obviously sorry that I haven't spoken about Syria itself, but I think it's amazing that so many of you have come because that gives the light of what I was going to say, which is that the average Briton knows 
nothing about Syria. It's a faraway land. If anyone knows anything about it at all, they'll probably think of it in terms of the Arab-Israel dispute and that Syria has generally been an unfriendly power, but beyond that they won't know very much. This just shows that you are not average uh, <coughs> members of the, uh, the British community as we stand. And yeah, over to you, Jane. Thank you. Can um, I'm going to stand up so I can see people um, at the back. Um, my name is James Sweeney. Um, I'm a professor of international law at the uh, law school here. Um, really, my area of expertise is what comes after intervention. So I've done a lot of work in the former Soviet Union and the former Yugoslavia after the fall of communism and after the uh, collapse of the former Yugoslavia. In particular, I do a lot of work in, in Kosovo. Uh, I've got a British Academy funded uh, project there at the moment looking at the role of um, journalists in developing and countering the histor historical narrative in relation to very controversial um, events. Um, but I took it upon myself to write a short piece for the conversation, which has now been viewed thousands and thousands of times. Um, and that got me um, a slot on BBC Breakfast at one point, which was a frightening early start, it has to be said. Um, so anyway, so I've ended up sort of mouthing off on this quite a bit recently. Uh, and so Simon very kindly asked, oh, there we are. Uh, Simon very kindly uh, asked me a lot to say a few words today. Um, so, uh, thank you to my beautiful sister here. Um, what I wanted to say was just some introductory words uh, about what the possible legal issues could be and how legal studies might be brought to bear on this, because I'm conscious, uh, I'm not the only lawyer in the room, uh, but people might not be totally familiar with, um, with, with the, kind of the legal way of, of looking at things. Um, so there are some big things that we all talk about as lawyers. You know, what counts as law? So we have long conversations about whether the Nazi laws were in fact correctly described as law. There's a follow-on question. Even if we know what law is, is international law law? Um, you know, there's no world parliament to make it. International law comes predominantly from treaties uh, and the nebulous notion of customary international law, um, the identification and formation uh, of which is a subject of you know, perennial study. Um, one of the most famous legal scholars of all time, uh, Herbert Hart, uh, for years denied that international law was uh, correctly described as law. Um, and then, of course, there's these issues, and I hinted at this a second ago, uh, the relationship between law and morals, between law and other cognate disciplines, like um, obviously politics, international relations, and what have you. Um, but I've said also here, there's, uh, it's worth talking about the relationship between law and wisdom. Uh, because my view is that, of course, not everything that's lawful is a good idea, and not everything that's unlawful is necessarily a bad idea. Um, and, for example, the, the, the independent inquiry into the COSO intervention in 1999, which you mentioned, um, described it um, as uh, illegal but legitimate, which is a wonderful phrase in law. Um, so they try to have it both ways, illegal but legitimate. So that's the issue of law, morals, cognate disciplines and things. In relation to Syria, I've just tried to suggest kind of three broad areas that we could talk about in terms of law. Um, but I'll stick to the top one, but I'm very, very happy to answer questions about the other ones. Um, so, uh, I've said there's, there's a body of law. Yes, yeah, that's the other thing. In international law, there isn't just one body of law. There's lots of overlapping systems. So there's a body of law about the use of force. That is to say, in simple terms, going to war. Um, that's called the Yusad Bellum. And for the record, whatever Parliament says about whether the use of force is authorised, whatever, should I say, whatever the UK Parliament says about whether the law is, um, use of force is authorised, has literally no bearing whatsoever on its legality in international law. It's just a, an exercise in self-aggrandisement. Um, there's another body of law on the conduct of hostilities. The idea is you meant to separate those two because for years afterwards you might not know whether the use of force was legitimate. People are still debating whether the uh, invasion of uh, Iraq in 2003 was lawful. It wasn't. But people are still debating them. Um, so you meant to separate the rules on the conduct of hostilities from the rules on going to war in the first place. So that's another body of law we could look at. Um, and finally, international criminal law um, and its relationship, for example, to um, the law on, on conflict or the conduct of hostilities. Um, but I just wanted to say a few words about the lawfulness of the airstrikes um, the other week. 
Next slide, please. Thank you. So, um, the rules on going to, uh, to, to, to war, um, the Yusai Bellum, generally prohibit the use of force. Uh, that reflects international custom, but you'll also see it in um, you know, the, the UN Charter post 1945. There's very, very few exceptions to that. One of the cast iron exceptions is self defence. That wouldn't seem to apply in relation to the US, UK, French attacks most recently on Syria. I have heard a very tenuous argument that there are enough US assets in Syria that it would justify an act in self defence. I don't buy that for a second. So we can put self-defence to one side. Um, another would be if the UN Security Council authorised the use of force under Article 42 of the UN Charter. It does do that sometimes. Uh, it did in relation to Libya in 2011, when Russia and China um, chose to abstain from the vote rather than veto it. Of course, as you know, um, in the UN Security Council at the moment, as permanent members, Russia and China uh, are basically consistently vetoing any attempts to condemn um, the Syrian regime or, uh, and, uh, of course, to use force against it. So, that's, so that doesn't help us. Uh, another potential reason to use force in another country would be if that country invites you. So Syria has lawfully invited Russia to carry out operations uh, on its territory. Again, though, having done that, doesn't give the invited country doesn't give their armed forces to do anything that um, the original state wouldn't be able to as well. They've each equally got to follow the rules on the conduct of hostilities, in theory. Um, there is a, uh, something that's been in the news yesterday, and it's going to get more as we, uh, as, as we go along, I think. Um, during the Cold War, when the um, UN Security Council was as deadlocked as it is now, uh, there was a system instead of going to the UN General Assembly where there are no uh, veto powers. Uh, to authorise the, um, the use of force for um, peacekeeping. Um, it was a, uh, a Western-led initiative uh, by the then US um, Secretary of State. Uh, but funnily enough, the first time it was activated, this, this idea is called Uniting for Peace, was against uh, the UK, France and Israel in respect of the Suez Crisis in um, 1956. Um, so, if those strikes were going to be lawful, or if we're going to talk about whether they were lawful, should I say. So not, not, not ones in the future that might be authorised in the United for, uh, United for Peace process, but the ones that have already taken place. We've got to say, well, is, is, are there any other norms emerging, perhaps, that could make them lawful? Thank you very much. So what about the Chemical Weapons Convention? Does that help? No, it doesn't. Uh, it creates a monitoring body to uh, investigate um, whether um, chemical weapons have been used, it, uh, that body doesn't have the power to attribute bl blame, and the treaty certainly doesn't alter the rules on using force in international law. So instead, you could try and make an argument from customary international law, as I said, the, the formation of which is a, you know, a, a, a lifetime study in its own right. What you could do, and what the UK did do in relation to the, the use of force this time with those airstrikes, was say it was justified on um, humanitarian uh, grounds. Now the UK has been arguing that this exists since at least 1992. Um, I can show you that because I've got a, a, it's an interesting memo from the FCO. It became a lot more prominent in the early days of the Blair government as part of the so-called ethical foreign policy, Robin Cook and all that. The late great Robin Cook. Um, and that's what was used to justify the intervention in um, Kosovo that we talked about a few minutes ago. Um, but the International Court of Justice, uh, in a 1986, uh, fascinating case, but I won't go into it now, uh, that Nicaragua brought against the United States, the International Court of Justice quite clearly said that using force on humanitarian grounds or against a political regime you don't agree with uh, doesn't exist. Okay? Likewise, the UK's own Attorney General, Goldsmith, in his secret legal advice, ten days before the whitewashed version was read out in Parliament, um, his good legal advice to Tony Blair about the invasion of Iraq was that there is no doctrine of humanitarian intervention. It's wishful thinking. It might be UK policy, but as I said, UK policy cannot in any way, shape or form unilaterally change international law. So, I'm not confident that there is a doctrine of humanitarian intervention. 
separate to the question of whether they should be. But if you were, if you were going to give legal advice, you would be on very thin ice to say that there was a doctrine of humanitarian intervention. If I was today's Attorney General, I would have done something else, though. I would have said, perhaps... Oh, sorry, humanitarian intervention was rebadged as RTP responsibility to protect in the 90s, but that doesn't change anything, in my opinion. Um, and it's been sort of condemned a bit after um, the actions of the Libya. What we could have done, next slide please, <laughs> is argue that there's a, a, an evolving, narrower ground for the use of force in international law. And this would be expressly on the grounds of um, preventing or punishing the use of chemical weapons. Now the problem is, I can't tell you now whether that norm has come into being. It's too early to say. What you have to do is watch how other states react to what the UK, France and the US did. Their reactions will tell you over time whether this was lawful. I mean, there's that apocryphal story uh, about the um, Chinese leader in the 60s being asked what, what he thought the effects of the French Revolution were. This was in the mid-20th century, and he said, well, it's too early to tell. Um, it's a bit like that in relation to um, you know, whether or not these attacks were lawful based on an emerging norm about um, preventing and punishing uh, the use of chemical weapons. Um, and of course, as I said, that's not what the UK argued. Um, anyway, I've put in a, uh, you know, put out there hopefully a few legal issues um, to talk about, and I'll not stop there, I think. Thanks, sir. Okay. Cheers. Great. Thank you very much, everyone. So we've got about 20 minutes left, although we do have the room a little bit longer if necessary. So what I thought we would do is just take a few questions from the floor. So who would like to kick us off? I guess this means we've done a very thorough job. <laughs> yes, question in front. Um, Please speak up so you can be captured on camera. Sorry, um, looking at Iraq and what's being done there and what it is right now, the state it is, which is still, I mean, I lived there, I came back from there a few days ago, still nowhere near it was during Saddam's time. So my question is, what's going to happen in Syria after all this is over? Is it going to be the same devastated state that Iraq is right now? Because Iraq is a terrible state at the moment. It's a failed thing. Sure. There's nothing wrong. There's okay, nothing let me here. just go in my bag. I'll get my crystal. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, you're raising a, a good point. Rahav can say a lot more about this. But what I'll just say quickly is that it seems... Yeah, it's quite like, it's quite difficult. I mean, I don't quite agree with comparing Iraq to Syria. Because, yeah, uh, yeah I quite, I quite, um, I've met many Iraqis. And, and, and I know that although that they were always opposing Saddam Hussein, but now the state of Iraq, now they kind of bring them that, okay, the days of Saddam was even much more, much better than now, so um, I don't think about this is kind of, well, in comparing Iraq to Syria, Syria I think now, you do know that the opposition group or all the militias are now in the north, so we have kind of an empty uh, oppositional uh, fields for Assad to kind of control Damascus and even Homs and so he has under control most of the Syrian bars and of, of course with exception with the northern bars. So there is a kind of free mapping Syria, this is what like, this is also very, I mean even the most expert political scientists cannot kind of uh, know what, what, what will happen in 10 years but what we, we are seeing uh, from hearing from friends and families inside Syria is that there is a kind of remapping, so of um, remapping of the Syrian uh, the Syrian kind of borders in terms of like uh, kind of uh, partitioning Syria into three states, and it's still happening now. I'm not saying that Assad's regime is trying to clean Sunnis from Damascus because because. I am convinced that he can't do that, although he is doing it from some parts which are the opposition like Daraya and Wuta and other parts, but he can't do that because he is still holding his face as saying that we are a legitimate, uh, a legitimate state holding everyone together, so we are against sectarianism and he's having this narrative, so he can't clean Sunnis, but at least he will keep Sunnis who are uh, quite tolerant to his uh, rule. So, Can I just say something yeah, on that, Ralph? Yeah. I think it's it's worth stressing that what's happening in Syria is not purely along sectarian lines. Yeah. As much as, yeah, as yeah. Um, yeah. people yeah. would have you believe that this yeah. is a quote-unquote sectarian yeah. conflict yeah. taking place yeah. between Sunni and Shia developed on, on yeah. 
1400 years of ancient True. hatred. Yeah. It, it's True. nonsense, True. it's not it, the case. It, it was not like that, and I think he knows that. Yeah, it's not yeah. Like that. yeah. But, in, uh, yeah but it's still like the Iranians now, they are owning homes, they are kind of buying homes. Uh, in, in, in Damascus, so and, and also buying homes in homes, so it's quite um, um, so you can't see what, what what will happen in ten years. Maybe um, demographically, a lot of things change demo demographically on the Syrian kind of ground. So I mean, I'm, I'm Kurdish by ethnicity, so we've been gassed by Saddam as well. Yes. I understand how bad it was, sure. but um, the way I see it right now compared to Syria again. Okay. It's, I see Western powers, including Russia and Iran, all playing games of chess and using Syria as proxy. And what really pisses me off is that six innocent people are dying on a daily basis. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. And Syria. And, I mean, I'm from Russia as well. I'm half Russian, half Kurdish. So I live there and I don't protect any of the countries other than even yeah. Britain at the moment. Because the way I see it is they're just playing games with each other yeah. and using civilian lives, you know. Sure. That's a cost. That's the biggest cost. And you're in Syria and you know. Yeah. Yeah. If I could just make a quick sort of personal reflection in terms of my, my own work and what have you. Um, I said a few minutes ago that I do uh, a lot of work in Kosovo. Uh, I've got very good friends there. Um, I know for certain, lawful or not, uh, the intervention that took place uh, in, in what is now Serbia and Kosovo um, has led to my friend being alive today. Um, however, that intervention took place <coughs> almost 20 years ago. Um, we are still there. You know, uh, UNMIC, the United Nations mission, is still there. Um, we are still supporting Kosovo to um, find its place in the world. Kosovo has got a population of just over 1.5 million people. It's tiny, and, we, and it's taken us 20 years to get to where it is now. And where it is now is far from perfect. One thing I will just add: I've been doing some work on on a book that's looking at the aftermath of the, the Arab uprisings and the fragmentation of the, the sort of sovereign state in the Middle East, if you will. And in a bunch of the interviews that I've done, people have just have been talking about what's happened in Syria. And they've, they've talked about this, this real dichotomy, this tension that they've had to face, whether they want to be safe or whether they want to have democracy. And it's a, a policy that, that a number of regimes, particularly across the Gulf, have been, uh, been using. They've been framing their rule as a, sort of a form of stability stability, authoritarian stability, but saying, look, you don't want democracy, because if you have democracy, then you go down the Syrian route. Okay, next question. Um, yeah. Question here, then there, then that. Um, so you ask, um, what, uh, can you comment on the events in Afrin regarding sort of the future of the Peshmerga, and what, how, what can you sort of see uh, happening in the future with that? Because they probably the most effective force against ISIS, so from the international community perspective they're probably useful in, uh, in the future. Yeah. Yeah, well, what's happening in Ukraine is totally uh, kind of, um, also we are saying that like, like the, the Olive Branch like, uh, operation was, uh, was completely against that and the thing is that like, Turkey is also has its, its own share in Syria so, so we are mentioning Russia and Iran but of course like Turkish did not boom up bomb Syria, but at the same time they are having their own realistic appro realist approach towards uh, preserving their own state borders and also kind of uh, making sure that the Kurds does not have their own state. So if we now is like a very difficult question because also the, v the VY day also kind of commits atrocities against Arabs. So it's, it's it, unfortunately, unfortunately, it's coming down to the eastern kind of sectarianism <coughs> between Arabs and Kurds, which could did not ha it was not like this before 2011, but it's now with this entrenched militaristic violence, it's now breaking into that. What's happening in Ephraim? Unfortunately, now there is um, it's, this is not a statement, but also like kind of from locals and friends there that the displaced people from Rhulta, they are kind of demographically place there in Ephraim, so from Damascus to Ephraim to the north of Syria, so, and this is under the cover of Turkey, so um, I think it happens also in Homs, in Aleppo, and in Damascus, so it's happening everywhere, so of course Kurds are victims like Syrians, like Arabs, and like many other ethnicities in Syria, so this is kind of a very uh, dirty war, so. Yes. I'm aware that there's been a, quite some discussion around um, 
conventional weapons versus chemical weapons, and how the latter, you know, seems so much more brave than, as Simon said before, um, the, the reactions are so much more um, big and important across the world. So I was wondering what some of your takes are on why this is such a big, big distinction between those two. James, do you want to kick that off? Um, I, I think possibly um, as some attempt to justify why we don't care about some places and we do about others. Um, see also Yemen. Um, and uh, or speaking as a lawyer, uh, as I said in my little talk, um, I think there is a better, albeit still extremely tenuous, argument that international law condemns the use of chemical weapons to a greater extent than potentially other forms of war crime. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I'm on thin ice making that. Uh, as I say, if I wanted to provide a fig leaf for UK involvement, that's what I would say, but I don't. It once again brings into play the element of national security, that if you hear about weapons which are weapons of mass destruction, <coughs> then people start worrying about themselves. Yes. Yes. Yeah, this is right. yeah. And there is a perception involved in it. It is perceived to be something just sort of beyond the pale. I think if you were to ask people that there's just something maybe slightly intangible about it. There's some perceived horror with it. And which incidentally is precisely why I would imagine that those involved in the deaths of certain Russian people in the last decade or so use weapons of mass destruction when you could use far more... It's just be because chemical weapons or nuclear thing, material spreads fear it means that everyone else who's on the de death list is going to be that little bit more frightened. Okay, there was a question. Yeah. Building on what's just said before, in a way, um, you mentioned before that Russia, thanks to its own support, had been aiding the Syrians to win the conflict. Why then would Assad choose to use chemical weapons, knowing what response it would provoke from the international community when he appeared to be winning the Syrian civil war? I was speaking to a diplomat about this, and this diplomat said pretty much the same thing as you, and he was suggesting that this was a, a false flag, it was an attempt to frame things in a particular way. And my view on this is that he does it because he can, he does it because he knows that he's done it in the past and he's got away with it, he does it because he's got them, he does it because he's able to use them, he does it because he wants to instill fear, he wants to punish people, he can do it. And it's not a, a good reason for doing it, it's certainly not strategic, it's going to provoke a response at some point, but it hadn't, so why stop? There is another thing that I think I can say about this, because like also from uh, some of locals in Duma and in Uta where the, the chemical weapon happened. It's important to mention that just before, in just a few days before the, chem the, the chemical massacre, like there was kind of negotiation that was like reached between Jaysh al-Islam, the, the, the Islamist militia that is uh, holding the city of Duma and, uh, and, the, and the regime. And they were talking about keeping Duma, people in Duma, instead of kind of uh, evacuating them to Idlib. And, and here it's important to say that Iran and Russia, although they are supporting the regime, but they are not always on good terms together. So Iran does not want the people of Duma to stay in Duma because they want these kind of empty spaces to be occupied. So this is another narrative that it might not be Russia, but it might be Iranian forces on the ground. So, this is also very contested, but this is from locals as well uh, on the ground. Sure. Um, Elias, and then there's some others. It's a bit related to this. Um, you know, even to think, uh, you know, making this thinking about what the other is thinking and putting them in a position of there being irrational, acting this way. You know, I think there's a, there, there should be a, some sort of analysis about, you know, in, in this age of so much fake news and misinformation, uh, how should we think about what's happening on the ground? Uh, do, we, do we cast Assad, you know, as brutal as he is, as this irrational man that just acts for the sake of, you know, him being evil? Or do we entertain other ideas that, you no, know, this thing could be, could have been staged by other powers? 
But the question is, how do we deal with this, especially from you know, international law point of view, when there's so much information that it's difficult to decipher uh, and make a conclusive, definite statement, you know, the case being, um, for example, what's happening in, in the chemical use of chemical weapons. To, the, to this day, it's still contested. So how, how do we deal with this when there's so much misinformation? Well, I was just going to say, in, to, in, in relation to the false flag thing, the way that this has been framed and presented to the public uh, isn't very clever if it was staged in some way, because in, a, amongst the news about the, this particular catastrophe has been wide publicity of the fact that this is 30-something times that uh, Assad has used it. And so, it, it, simultaneously, it might give the West a, a, some kind of pretext for action. But it also points to the fact that the same thing has been done and the West did absolutely nothing. So if it was going to be a false flag operation, it's kind of uh, one which actually puts a lot of discredit uh, <clears throat> on the people who are exploiting it. That would seem to me rather a, an odd tactic. Yeah, and also the brutality of Assad's regime kind of goes back to the 80s, so it's not just something recent. So we have the Hama Maskar in, in 1982, we have many other Maskars, we have Saddam's Maskars, and because the Saddam Hussein's regime is very similar to the Ba'ath regime in Syria, so we can't just say if he didn't commit this chemical massacre. To be honest, as a Syrian, not as an academic, I don't care if he committed that massacre because he has committed many other massacres by conventional weapons before, so he's, he's already a brutal Um, yeah, I, I can't address directly um, the issue about fake news. What I can talk about is, is fake law, and there's some of it up on the screen at the moment. Um, that was the UK argument. France and the USA have stayed completely silent. They haven't claimed that the attacks were lawful because there is no good argument. We, the British, like to pretend that we play by the rules. So. Uh, we did this when we um, assassinated Raid Khan, a person I had absolutely no um, you know, sympathy for. Um, but David Cameron boasted on the steps of 10 Downing Street that it was lawful, and he gave a sort of quasi-legal justification, which radically altered everyone's understanding of how the UK understands self-defence. Um, here we've got another attempt to, as I say, push forward an argument which I think is, is, is weak. It's also potentially very, very dangerous. Um, my argument about chemical weapons would be fairly well confined and couldn't be, ordinarily you would think, used against us. However, this argument, humanitarian intervention, uh, is almost certainly going to be seized upon by Russia to continue its uh, activities in Ukraine. And if I were in Latvia, Lithuania uh, or Estonia, I would be getting very, very nervous. James. Um, can I, I mean, this, this is a general observation on international. I'll, I'll, I'll pose this sort of challenge. One of the things about Syria, really, for international law, is that it highlights that international law is structurally incapable of dealing with it. Whether you look at it from international humanitarian law, international criminal law, uh, use of force, Syria highlights how ineffective, how, in, how structurally incapable international law is actually. Uh, for engaging with this situation, um, and across multiple areas. And one of the questions where perhaps that's uncomfortable for international lawyers is, of course, are we actually part of the problem or part of the solution? Yeah, I think adding to that as well, it also raises questions about the, the nature of the United Nations. Yeah. yeah. And particularly the, the Security Council, I, I'm personally of the view that the United Nations as is is a pretty moribund organization unless there is this this move, this norm, this perhaps emerging norm as you were alluding to James about going to the General Assembly rather than yeah. the Security Council which is just frozen as it has been for well its whole ex existence, I think. most of it, yeah. I mean, there, there was a there was a, a decent patch in the mid nineties. Oh, um, sorry, I'm doing it this <laughs> Um what was I gonna say? Um, oh yeah, um, sorry, uh, my colleague James Summers also from the law school. Um, yeah, you know on that first slide when I talked about you know big big questions, what is law, uh, what does it mean to say things lawful, is international law law? One of the other big questions that we have all the time, the big issues for international lawyers is, is about effectiveness. Um, the effectiveness of international law, including uh, even self-contained regimes like the European Convention on Human Rights, 
uh, effectiveness is a big deal. It is something that we constantly struggle with. Um, so, um, you know, it, it, it is something that we think about and we are troubled by. Um, okay, we're rapidly running out of time. So, Richard, Tom, and chap in the back corner, three questions all at once. Not asking them all at once. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, I thought it was interesting, John, John View at King's wrote an article this week saying that the West's first mistake with Syria was calling for Assad to go. And he argued that the reason for that was because the West has been unable to articulate an acceptable political alternative to Assad that doesn't empower IS. So I, want, I wanted to know from the panel what you thought of uh, uh, View's position, and if you can, is there um, an alternative political future post-Assad that you can imagine? Can, can I make very quickly the first, I mean, a very interesting question. It would seem, it would seem, three all at once? Oh, sorry. Well, I've got to go, so can I just answer that one and then I'll go. Um, uh, I'll give my little bit of an answer. Um, the, the tactic with Iraq, of course, was kind of forced on the British government, but you, you personify the problem. You identify an individual and make people think that it's, you know, that, that focus all the hatred on that individual. And clearly they did exactly the same with uh, Assad as they did with Saddam. And that was their instinctive reaction, is go for the lowest common, you know, um, factor. Okay, we'll come back to that point because I'm sure yeah, that, sorry. that there are other things to say. Uh, Tom and the chap in the corner. Just two, two very brief observations. I think, I think it's a very dangerous road to go down to say it doesn't really matter if it was a sad that carried out this act. He's a bad guy, he's done bad things in the past. If you believe in a rules-based system, it seems to be very important that you obey the rules, you allow the inspectors to come in, you have a proper evidence base before you take action rather than punishment taking place before the evidence takes uh, is even established. The other point is a very interesting wide-ranging discussion. The one word that hasn't been mentioned is Trump. Um, and I think what Mark said about these sort of delusions of British power is absolutely right. And I don't think we should be under any um, misapprehension that the United, the United Kingdom would have carried out this action or any military action, I think, had it not been for the United States initiating it. And I don't think the policy was decided really in, in London, the policy was decided in Washington. Our decision, along with the French, was whether to support the United States or not. And that just strikes me in some way, some of these discussions about the sort of humanitarian law can become a bit of a, a, bit of a distraction, um, because it seems to me that's the decision. And I don't pretend to know what the real motivations were for the Trump administration, but my guess is they're not principled objections to the use of chemical weapons. Um, and I think the friend at the front here talking about this being a sort of pawns, you know, and in international powers is much more mm -hmm. accurate. So just to okay, question at the back, and then a very quick one from Julie. Uh, yeah, I was just going to ask, uh, most people probably accept that the worst thing to come out of war in Syria was the rise of Bayer, and now that it's been defeated with the conventional use of force, um, people probably say the worst thing that could happen is for them to come back, but looking at how the Taliban has made a massive resurgence in Afghanistan post-Western intervention, you know, I think that now the best thing for the West to do is to look to stabilise the region as a whole, which may be stopping backing rebels who are clearly losing this fight and looking for some sort of settlement for the side so that we don't see a resurgence there. Julie. Um, on uh, Assad and opposition forces, um, I think we need to be very aware that there's um, an attempt to legitimise Assad and that there's an attempt to delegitimize uh, the opposition. And I think Rahab's point about uh, 2013 and the release by Assad of jihadists, because he knew exactly what kind of havoc that would wreak on uh, Arab Spring, Syrian Spring kind of uh, democracy, is uh, really important to uh, keep in mind as well. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I'll share and then we'll go round and yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so Assad um, unable to, to actually think of a future without Daesh and Assad being the sort of victor against Daesh. Um, I think that overemphasizes the importance of Daesh within the, the Syrian conflict, and that's where I would certainly disagree with with John View, John View, not just on this, but a great deal of, of his analysis previously. I think Daesh is certainly key. Daesh is a certainly abhorrent phenomena that's come out of this crisis and, and in Iraq. But if you look at it in terms of just hard numbers, and I feel a bit uncomfortable doing this, 
quantifying human life, but you look at it and, and the Assad regime is responsible for killing over 90% of all of those who have been killed in the, the crisis, which is over 450,000 people, compared to the very small number from Daesh. And there is evidence about uh, the Assad regime being uh, responsible for using the, the chemical weapons. Um, it's not been made public yet, but it's been um, documented in Washington and in London that there is evidence. I agree about the rules-based system, whether it should be made um, made public or not is probably true, but um, there is allegedly evidence. Um, as for Trump, yeah, there was a great deal of debate in Washington. I was there when the debate was taking place, not actually in the room, obviously, but I was in Washington, and there were debates between um, between Trump and Pompeo as to what the right type of approach was, and, and Pompeo was, was pushing for a much harder approach. Trump was wanting to be a little bit more calculated, but certainly the, U, uh, the UK was following Washington's lead, again, without necessarily having a clear, without Washington having a clear sense of an end game, which I think is, is characteristic of the Trump presidency generally. Um, the question about the worst thing coming out of Syria being Daesh, I um, reject that entirely. I would say the worst thing to come out of the Syrian revolution, war, um, tragedy is the refugee crisis. The, um, the massive displacement of people, the, the catastrophic number of deaths. 11 million people displaced from their homes. That's essentially the entire population of London taken out and, and forced to find new homes amidst a war zone, amidst pretty abhorrent behavior of, of an Assad regime, of his Russian and Iranian backers, some pretty disgusting behaviour from some of the rebel groups, not all, but there are some um, some nasty elements to it, and the complete destruction of the Syrian infrastructure. This will be a, a generational problem that that will go on and on without serious um, financial investment once there is a, a solution, if indeed there is. As for dealing with Assad, I just, I, if you're going to have a set of values and norms and, and rules, a rule-based system that that as a responsible member of the international community you want to uphold, you cannot deal with him. You cannot work with someone who's killed so many people, not just in the post-2011 phase, but structurally, methodically, since coming to power, building on the legacy of his father who exterminated 30,000 people in, in Homs in 1982, who routinely imprisoned people, who routinely detained, tortured people, who stripped any form of civil society out of the state, hollowed out uh, any form of pro-democracy movement, who detained and tortured children in the early stages of the Arab uprisings, a pro-democracy uprising, a peaceful pro-democracy uprising. There were some children who graffitied a wall, they were imprisoned, they were tortured, and when their parents went to the police station to say, we want our sons back, the police chief said, you need to go away and have more sons. That is disgusting. I'm sorry, we cannot sit bring your woman. by. Sorry? Bring, bring your woman. And yeah. So, no, I don't Far think you can policy. make a deal with someone who behaves like that. Yeah, so, um, just when, when I said that we don't, I mean, the, 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 the last massacre, the, the last massacre, the last massacre, well, to be honest, that Assad all the ground, so, um, if he's not allowing investigators to come into the to the area where people were when 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 the massacre happened, then this pose a question. Other other thing that why because like if you are seeing an airplane like kind of um, with barrel pumps um, targeting people on the ground, what and if this is videos and photographs and you see people under the rubble, what other what other proof <laughs> that you can get other than like uh, uh, the, the chemical you, the use of chemicals? Only one side has claims. Yeah. 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 So yeah. Um, I think um, I think I've mentioned most of what I wanted to say. So. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, that's great. So. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay, I'll just I'll just respond very briefly, principally to yourself. Um, about the, you mentioned sort of rule-based system uh, and whether law is a distraction in this sort of conversation. Well, I mean, as I said at the very beginning, there's a lot to be said about the relationship between law and other disciplines. I think we'd all agree that uh, somebody who is an uh, expert in biology 
um, isn't by implication denying the importance of chemistry. Um, so I don't think law has a monopoly on looking at this issue. It just happens to be what I'm an expert in. Um, as for the issue of evidence, um, I've put on the screen there the UK argument, uh, and at the bottom you'll say, and that these conditions <coughs> have been met. If, if you read the, the full, um, uh, full guidance, uh, it spells out why they think those conditions have been, be uh, been met. But I think, you know, even if we accept that this is a test, and I don't, um, then I'm not convinced it's been met. Um, generally accepted by the international community. Really? Um, you know, uh, because there hasn't been, a, 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 unlike the situation in um, former, um, Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, as was in 99, the events there had been universally condemned, uh, not least by the UN Security Council, despite uh, Russia being a long-standing ally um, of the former Yugoslavia uh, and it continuing to be a, a, an ally of Serbia. Um, objectively clear that there's no practical alternative. Well, again, I'm not sure whether that is the case. Um, then, uh, yeah, well, I, it's, so I, I'm not 100% convinced that the, the, these conditions, even if they exist, uh, have been met. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Rahab. Just one final point on Julie's questions about the opposition and, 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 uh, and assets and why we are delegitimizing, de there is a kind of narrative of delegitimizing the opposition. It's important to, to say that after just one month of the peaceful, of the mass peaceful demonstration that happened in Syria, Assad came out and said in a speech that uh, we are fighting jihadists, we are fighting terrorists, we are fighting Islamists. So it's important that the creation of Daesh at that time, or even after in, 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 in six months um, after after uh, after the after the, fir after the first six months of the peaceful demonstration, is that to securitize and to legitimize his kind of authority and to, to kind of brings uh, the question that he is fighting ISIS, but in, but but he was saying that he's fighting jihad and Islamists from day one. Um, Okay, I guess all that remains to be done is for me to thank my fellow panellists, uh, James Sweeney, Mark Barnett, and uh, Rahaf al Duhu. Particularly thank you to Rahaf for, for coming up from Manchester. So uh, I really appreciate that. <laughs>